Clergy Life and Ministry is um, a structure that was set up, I think, in 1986 by the Australian Catholic bishops. And so in, um, the understanding is that every diocese would appoint a, its own director for clergy life and ministry, and the, the national director would assist those diocesan directors to, um, to do their job and to resource them and to do a national network and be a point of reference <coughs> and encouragement for them. I'm also an executive secretary to the Bishop's Commission for Church Ministry and the, um, the Catholic uh, Council for Clergy Life and Ministry that advises that commission. So um, I'm a conduit to the bishops to, um, for a national feel of uh, issues and programs and resources that might be taken up by individual dioceses. Thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned there that you assist the directors for clergy life and ministry in doing their job at the diocesan level. What, what is that? Well, um, once a year we have um, conferences as a state count, um, group of directors and then once a year we have a national conference. So those conferences we have... Um, sharing of report, reports and about the issues that are rising and about resources and programs and strategies that might further address the, the needs of um, clergy in Australia and according to the Integrity of Ministry document. So we'll talk a little today about issues of ongoing formation, for instance. Is that something that directors <coughs> of the clergy, life and ministry are responsible for within each diocese? Correct, yeah. Um, the primary um, responsibility is the bishop and the director assists the bishop in that responsibility. Thank you. Um, can you explain what role the new body Catholic Professional Standards Limited will have in relation to the work that you do? Well, as I understand it, um, the new body will monitor um, the... Um, integrity of ministry and the protocols put in place for the safeguarding of children and ethics in, in ministry. And then it's my hope that uh, they also monitor some uh, developments that might um, be approved and be embraced. But one is, uh, is the appraisal of ministry, for example, um, to um, ensure that uh, diocese and clergy are faithfully responding to the, um, the invitation of integrity of ministry principles. And is that something that you will have personal responsibility for as well as the um, national director? Of would you fall, you know, fall into the gamut of a national network and a national resource that would um, be given to individual dioceses. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Um, Sister Crotty, can I turn to you, please? Can you state your full name? Uh, Evelyn Jean Crotty. Thank you. And, Sister, you have a master's degree in clinical pastoral counselling, is that right? That's correct. Um, and you, within that degree, you majored in supervision in pastoral ministry. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, where did you undertake that study? I took that study in Emmanuel College in Boston. Thank you. Um, you are an accredited, a senior accredited supervisor with the Association of Pastoral Supervisors and Educators in the UK, is that right? That's correct. Um, and there is an association in Australia and New Zealand uh, called the Association for Clinical Pastoral Education. You're also accredited with them. I was accredited with that. I'm no longer. I'm now accredited with the association um, um, AAOS, it's called Australasian Association of Supervision. I'm a supervisor trainer with them and also with Transforming Practices, which is a professional association for pastoral supervisors. So that association that you've just referred to, um, that deals with supervision of all kinds, does it? Pastoral and non-pastoral? Uh, the Australasian Association of Supervision is for professional supervisors and the supervisors that we train are actually are recognised through that association, through that professional association. So, and as pastoral supervisors, they're recognised through transforming practices. Can you just explain a little what transforming practices is? 
Transforming Practices is an association of pastoral supervisors, which Dr. Alec Nelson and myself and a couple of other supervisors formed in 2005. As, as uh, one for the training of past, pastoral supervisors. It's an ecumenical um, associ association. Does it have an accreditation or registration process? Yes, we do. How many accredited uh, we, ha we have about 12 who are, um, um, who are um, recognised, we call it. We're not a training institute as, as such. Um, but we both have training in transformative uh, learning. Thank you. Um, Sister, you, you're also a member of a religious order, is that right? I am the Institute of the Sisters of Mercy of Australia in Papua New Guinea. Thank you. When did you join the order? In 1965. Thank you. Um, you are the coordinator of the urban ministry movement in Sydney, is that That's right? correct. Can you just... Tell us a little what that is. Uh, yes, I, I formed um, um, that little group back in uh, 1990. Um, I did my training in clinical pastoral education at the Austin Hospital back in 1980. And I was very interested, as I was going to be moving out into a housing commission area, I was interested in being able to take that process more out of the hospital and more into an urban uh, way of training. Um, of people. So we talked about it for some years. I was living out in Cranbrook for six years and we had ministers of other religions coming to us saying, how do you sustain, this, sustain yourself in this kind of work? We found we had parole officers and um, community services people burning out very quickly and we were finding that we were being sustained and it was through the reflective practice on the work that we were doing that sustained us. So I um, created this course and then eventually went to Boston to do further training. They had a parish-based program. I wanted to make it urban so that we could also train um, uh, chaplains in uh, prison ministry, um, people working on the streets, people working in Aboriginal ministry, uh, con congregations, parishes, all that, much broader. And it was always an ecumenical uh, program. Does that program still exist? I ran that program <clears throat> until 2014 and I handed it to my institute, handed that to the Uniting Church. We've leased it to them for five years. I had been running it for nearly 30 years. <laughs> it was time to hand it over and, um, and that was the best place to put it because we've worked very closely with the Uniting Church over the years. I've trained many of their ministers who were really interested in getting into the area of looking at pastoral ministry and being supervised in their, in their practice. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Sister. I'll, I'll come back to the topic of pastoral supervision a little later and ask you to elaborate. But, um, Father McDonough, if I could turn to yes. you, can you state your full name, please? Thomas Patrick McDonough. Thank you. And, Father, you're the Provincial Superior of the Congregation of the Passion. Yes, I am. Um, how long have you been a member of that order? I've been a member of that order for... Uh, 51 years. Thank you. Um, and the province of which you're the superior, that covers Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea and Vietnam. Is That's that correct, right? yes. Um, how long have you been provincial? Six years. Uh, four years, sorry. Four years. Um, and you were ordained in, um, I think, 1972? 1972, yes. Thank you. Um, have you also been involved in formation? Uh, yes, I have been on a number of levels. After I was ordained, I was sent for further studies uh, in theology uh, at the university, Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. When I returned uh, at the Yarra Theological Union, a consortium of eight or nine religious orders uh, who trained their students together, formed our students together, I taught there for the next 14, 15 years. During that time, I was also uh, in our own domestic residence, our domestic passionist seminary with our own students. I was involved in their general formation as one of the three or four seniors in the house. I was dean of studies for them during all of that time. I was also uh, superior of the house for 10 years. I was also on our provincial advisory council as a consultant for initial formation during that time. 
uh, <coughs> it, um, uh, after that, I was uh, I finished work in the, the seminary and began work in parishes. Um, and during that time, also uh, as a member of the provincial uh, advisory council, uh, I helped set up our own uh, province formation commission and was chair of that a number of times and a member of it for 14 or so years. Um, also, again, a consultant for ingoing, initial and ongoing formation. And now as um, provincial, I have overall responsibility for the education and um, formation of our men in Papua New Guinea, Vietnam, and here in Australia where we have young men in formation. Thank you. Um, how many young men do you have in the process of formation at the moment? Uh, in the three countries, 55. Thank you. How many in Australia? Uh, there are five studying here in Australia. There are um, four or five in the novitiate, international novitiate here in Australia. There are about, um, last year there were nine in Papua New Guinea and there were um, 30 approximately in, um, in Vietnam. Thank you, Father. Um, you're also the Vice President of Catholic Religious Australia, is that right? Yes, I am. And that's the body which oversees religious orders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I wouldn't say oversee, but coordinates with the coordinate. religious orders. Yes. Thank you, Father. Um, uh, Father Bird, can I turn to you, please, um, and ask you some questions in relation to ongoing formation and its development over time. Can you... Just give us an overview, please, in the period before 1992 when a papal document came out that I'll ask you about, um, but focusing first on the period before 1992, what ongoing formation activities were available to priests and religious? Before 1992? Yes. Uh, um, not a great deal of resources were available. Um, in the time... I might just refer to my notes. I so, I've a few timeline here. Well, I think if we go back to, say, to the 1950s, um, ongoing formation was really um, seen as clergy gatherings in the presence of the bishop, and the bishop would just would give um, um, so, um, talks and directions, really. And um, as time went on, um, at that time, support was uh, informal amongst each other, but there's a large body of clergy and there were larger presbyteries, <coughs> for example, and um, there were long, almost apprenticeships of assistant priests up to 14, 18 years in some dioceses. So there was a degree of sort of ad hoc, natural accompaniment, but that was, you know, hit or miss. Sometimes it's marvellous, other times it's disastrous. Um, in the mid-70s and to the mid-80s, um, ongoing formation began to be provided um, by diocese, and it was mainly in the area of uh, pastoral formation, or more about restructuring parishes, parish councils, things like that. Not so much on personal formation and development. And uh, support was more problematic as, you know, numbers quickly dropped away, so workloads suddenly Priest and there were fewer um, priests and there were greater degrees of burnout and, and needs and the support for ongoing formation and what we would recognise as the good things in integrity of ministry you know, weren't really happening as you would wish in, in that area. Um, there was an emergence of um, supervision. There was um, clinical pastoral education. There were focus groups, support groups, supervision groups. But... Um, they were sort of not normative, beginning to happen and, and to emerge. Um, in 1981, the um, Australian bishops um, constituted a, a centre called St Peter's Centre in Canberra, and um, that was for ongoing formation and re renewal. So it was really targeted at that age group of uh, clergy that were ordained perhaps in the 60s to 50s and had a lot of catch-up to do with... Um, <coughs> with um, pastoral formation and areas of, of um, 
personal development. That closed in 1989, and um, about 330 priests did the sabbatical course uh, in that time. Was that a matter of um, voluntary take-up by those priests, or were the diocese requiring people to attend in the time that it was Yeah, I, I, um, I can't give a really accurate answer to that, but, uh, I mean, I know some men who did go, and they went as volunteers, so it could have been a bit of both, but... Um, I think the large part was that people went because they wanted to uh, to be renewed and to find some support. And um, so in 1985, um, the Australian bishops brought a priest called Father Vince DeWire, and that introduced a more systematic and sophisticated approach where um, 16 dioceses, I think, participated in that program with Vince DeWire. And so clergy entered into um, psychological assessment and they had feedback about that assessment. And then there was training programs for um, priests to accompany one another um, on the level of accompaniment of listening to one another to be supported to make suggestions. And from that, uh, what we call support groups happened. And there are some still good, a good number of those groups happening. But that was on a level of support and type of thing. Again, and, Father, yeah. do, do you know, was participation in, in that program that uh, Father Dwyer was running, mm -hmm. was that a voluntary thing or was it uh, something required by the diocese? Um, well, I participated that myself in Melbourne and um, uh, great numbers turned up here and I just can't remember. But I think um, Archbishop Little of didn't have a, a culture of making things mandatory. It was quite usually invitational. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and that was quite a, a successful program, but I said the 16 dioceses uh, participated in that. But that was the beginning then of ongoing formation. And then the year after, in 86, the Ministry to Priest program, which is now known as Clergy Life and Ministry, began. And that was with, in most dioceses, there was a director and they began a national network and conferences. And so that led up to the late 80s into Pastoris Dabo Vobis emergence. Thank you. So Pastoris Dabo Vobis was the papal document which came out in 1992, mm -hmm. um, and it included quite explicit statement in relation, statements in relation to ongoing formation, including, um, I think this is one you've singled out there, there is no profession, job or work which does not require constant updating if it is to remain current and effective. Correct, yes. Uh, was that a significant change in terms of messages from the Vatican on this topic? Yes, I think that would mark a significant change. That was a, a, a fresh approach. And I remember um, formators in seminaries of the time were um, so pleased with the document that it gave... Um, credence for what, the work that they were already doing or attempting to do and promote. Um, what, did, what practical change resulted? Um, well, the big emphasis was they identified human formation as the hinge for the other pillars, intellectual, spiritual and, and personal, um, as, uh, as, the, as the most important element in formation. In other words, if you're not a, a functioning, natural, warm, loving human being, um, you can learn theories and have degrees, but it's not going to do much. We heard a little earlier in the week about um, the formation process for in the preordained period, um, <coughs> focusing on the period after ordination. Uh, did things change after 1992? Um, post-ordination. Um, yes, by that stage there was a clergy life and ministry director and they began to have programs and um, annual conferences, uh, guest speakers, sometimes international speakers. Um, and there was probably an emergence from um, those speakers and the input often were of pastoral formation, but began to have some topics about mental health and um, those kind of awarenesses. Burnout was a big um, issue at that time and what caused burnout. And there was a call for um, a change of role for clergy and different living conditions, not to live in presbyteries where the office was and to 
had more time off and a sabbatical program was introduced. In some parishes, the long, a long service uh, program was introduced. Some of the material which has been submitted to the Commission suggests that the, the take-up of those kind of uh, ongoing formation programs was, was fairly ad hoc. Would, yeah. Do you agree with I that? I would agree with that. And I think that's sort of the kernel that we'll probably get to, that it's in, it has been invitational and um, has been taken up probably for, by the usual suspects, uh, the high-functioning, interested people. But the degree of non-compliance um, you know, is has been the majority of people. In the 1990s, were you aware of any diocese that made attendance at those kind of ongoing for formation seminars mandatory? Um, well, I just wouldn't know. At 92, I wouldn't be in a position to know. Um, have I heard of that since? Um, I haven't heard that being said, that a diocese has made it mandatory. Um, having said that, though, I have, in my experience of this past year of being national director, it's the rural diocese, the small diocese, they may be fewer in number, but they seem to have almost 100% um, turn up to their, their, their retreats and their conferences. When the bigger diocese, people get lost with that, <coughs> that kind of sense of um, feeling that you belong to presbyterate and that... Um, that you'll, you'll be missed if you're not there, <coughs> in, a, in a good sense. Um, Father, the integrity and ministry document, uh, which came out in 2004, is that right? Yeah, um, 2004, about then, I think that's correct. Um, that also contained statements uh, in relation to ongoing formation, including calling on bishops and superiors to make provision for continuing education programs, educative and support structures, opportunities for formation, development and renewal. Um, again, was that a significant change in terms of the directive? Um, it wasn't a significant change. I mean, it was refreshing. It was um, in a document that was national and that was approved and received. Um, now, before the document was printed, there, were, there was an increased desire for those things. But again, when you look at the um, attendance rates, um, there's, there's a room for criticism there. As in how effectively but, but not enough people were taking up the opportunity to engage in ongoing formation and all its attributes that are you know, for uh, well-being personal development, uh, for learning and skills and management, those in supervision of um, their own ministry. Um, the document was there, and um, it probably helped some people come to it, but, uh, but it, it didn't sort of change people overnight. I ask the rest of the panel whether focusing on that period after integrity and ministry came out, um, whether they have anything to add about the take-up of the um, ongoing formation opportunities that it referred to? My limited experience of working in dioceses suggests that um, Father Burke's comment about country dioceses is probably quite accurate. My experience of working in the Diocese of Sale in the last 12 months, uh, they have 27 priests and the majority of those priests have turned up to uh, ongoing formation sessions that I've been running around human development and uh, relational understandings. And uh, I've been quite impressed by the availability, the psychological availability of uh, these priests to, to learn and to change and to discuss and to participate in the processes that are offered to them. So I, I, anecdotally, I'd agree that I think the take up after integrity of in ministry was probably pretty slack. Uh, but I can see some evidence that um, priests, both locally trained and ordained priests and priests from overseas, 
are both, at least in the one diocese, uh, diocese that I've had involvement with of recent times, have been positively engaged and can see the benefit and ha have shown a real interest in the psychological. Uh, and that says to me that there's a growing awareness that this may well be a gap in their formation and that they need this and that they are eager to participate in programs that offer them assistance in this area. Both uh, Dr Leary and myself uh, lectured at the Institute of Counselling in Sydney that was set up in 1970 in the Archdiocese of Sydney um, and it continued, it, it moved over to the Catholic University in the 2000s. Um, there weren't a lot of priests who were attracted, it was a course in counselling, two or three years, a diploma, a lot of religious women came um, and a lot of religious men came and then a lot of lay people came. Um, but I don't, don't think it's around now. Can I just ask on, on that, I'll come to you in a moment, Father, but can I just ask specifically on that? Is that a, a course that um, the, those religious institutes uh, would have paid for on behalf of their members? Yes, um, well, lay people paid for themselves. The <laughs> religious brothers and, and nuns would have been paid for. The diocesan and priests, I think, paid for themselves out of their own stipends to come. And uh, as time went on, some of them would have been paid for by their diocese. It was in Sydney. Um, it was a very successful program over time, but uh, it didn't last, unfortunately. Mm. The, that uh, particular program eventually morphed uh, through, it was on site at Australian Catholic University and around about uh, 2009, 10, it morphed into the Masters of Clinical Counselling at Australian Catholic University. And some of the staff, um, Ron Perry, who initiated the program, originally still have engagement with that program. The one thing it did lose, and this is one of the the critical aspects of ongoing professional development, when it morphed into that more academic program, not that the original one didn't have academic content to it, because it did, but it lost the experiential. So a big part of that Institute of Counselling Diploma was two or three years of group process. Yes. Every week there was a group process that the student was uh, required to engage yes. in. And that was terribly formative because it assisted with what we were talking about yesterday, and that is a growing sense of self-awareness, which is absolutely imperative to good professional practice. And getting feedback, feedback loops. That's right. Yeah. Father McDonough, I think. I was just going to comment on the experience of religious during yes. some of that time. Um, I'm not quite as familiar, or not familiar, with um, some of the practices of the the religious brother congregations, but for the clerical congregations and for ourselves during the late, the late 80s and 90s, even earlier, um, after the Vatican Council, as some of the rigidity in religious orders eased, there was great excitement about professional development, personal development, theological development, human development. Um, <clears throat> there were opportunities for people to ask for opportunities from their superiors, um, from their congregations to do studies, part-time, university, uh, overseas. There were um, opportunities offered by religious congregations to, their, to their, their people, not just those who, like myself at the time, you only asked, were asked to go overseas to study if you're going to end up teaching in the seminary itself. But um, on just broader issues of ministerial skills, people would do courses in sociology, psychology, counselling. Um, some would take more practical courses if their issues were administration or business management. Uh, so there were many opportunities like that. Congregations provided their own educational opportunities. Um, they would have seminars, especially the sisters, um, sometimes more so than the men. Overseas lecturers would be brought in to educate and offer uh, seminars around the country, which still happens uh, today. So there were many of those sorts of opportunities, which were often aimed at individuals rather than the culture of the, the whole group. 
um, as you moved into the 90s um, with integrity of ministry um, and with the growing awareness of the issues of child abuse or, or um, perhaps more so then rather as alongside the child abuse was the professional standards lapses and boundary violations. Um, a number of the, the focuses became more centred on either those particular areas of professional standards or they were focused on, um, as um, Father Burke mentioned, the human, human development, well-being, wholeness. That is where that integrity of the ministry document was very helpful to add force to what, in fact, was happening um, already amongst the religious orders and, and the, the religious themselves. I'd agree with him that um, congregations had educational episodes for their congregations on integrity of ministry and how to um, implement it. Some um, had their own little projects of, in my congregation, it was a life plan for each religious that they would draw up. That would be, um, they would draw it up then consult with our formation commission. The various congregations also during that time, the 90s, would have their own formation commissions that would try to change the culture uh, to one of lifelong learning from initial formation and then you're right for the rest of your life. And those commissions would have plans and projects. They would earmark people for further development. They would earmark needs that needed to be addressed. Um, but by and large, um, it was left to the individual how, how well or not um, they did that. During, since then, I think one of the challenges for um, in religious congregations is many of the religious now, apart from the, the newer generation just coming through or the orders from overseas, um, <clears throat> is the ageing of the religious and they're beyond doing courses and they're, they're not interested now in going along to a seminar. Um, and so a lot of that, some of that ongoing formation and ongoing learning and lifelong learning emphasis laps because many of the religious over the last years have reached a point where they were 60, 70 and 80 and up and um, no longer had the, the energy or the drive for those programs. And now with the, this particular Royal Commission, uh, emphasis has come back again on the need even for, the, for them um, to uh, take on board uh, the need for, for more education development and um, compliance. Thank you. C can I ask, you, you focused on what was happening at the level of particular congregations. Um, were those congregations getting guidance from any national uh, bodies or policy documents in terms of the principles that should guide their ongoing Apart formation. from things like the integrity of ministry or pastores da vobis didn't have as much influence on religious because many of those things were already taking place. Um, so it wasn't a significant shift for religious when pastores da vobis came out. Um, much of that was already happening. But for the, uh, during that time, CRA was called um, ACLRI, the Australian um, Community Leaders of Religious um, Organisation. There was a central body, as there is now, of the CRA, <clears throat> and then there were also state bodies, um, which were offshoots, um, independent of, but also offshoots, because they had the same clientele, in fact, but all the religious in New South Wales, all the religious in South Australia. <clears throat> and those independent bodies were also, um, as religious, together, discussing, planning, um, with their lead, the, the organisational leadership team of a number of religious men and women, of what was needed for the different congregations under their, their um, umbrella to provide programs for it. But in terms of um, any central management or protocol or something that was laid down, no, no. What about now? No, still not, no. Um, the Catholic Professional Standards hopefully um, will mandate something or the Royal Commission will mandate something in that area that's required. Um, we, as CRA, um, we have done, we 
have done and produced a draft document for initial formation for all religious communities, men, women, active, apostolic, um, protocols for professional standards and personal development, but not for ongoing formation or supervision. Thank you. Do you have a view, Father, about whether uh, priests and religious should be mandated to participate in ongoing formation, professional development? Yes, I do. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, <clears throat> in speaking from my situation as a provincial, I think one of my prime responsibilities is to ensure that the religious for whom I'm responsible uh, have the, um, the appropriate education, formation and compliance as required for them to effectively be ministers to people. I think one of the challenges for religious is calling out the bad behaviour of um, our fellows, partly because unlike perhaps diocesan priests who live one in a parish, we live together and we see it up front, but we also have a much closer relationship with each other as a religious family. So for, and most of us aren't confrontational by nature, so calling out bad behaviour is um, not a, a strength that we have. It's not a strength that I have, but it's part of the job and also um, part of professional behaviour now um, requires that sort of um, compliance. And if their own internal self-discipline doesn't allow for it, uh, we do. And as I mentioned in a briefing with you, that um, we are on the point in our congregation, as the Archdiocese of Sydney may be too, of making appraisal and um, compliance um, mandatory. And the, uh, the consequence of not complying would be withdrawal from, from ministry so or asking the Archdiocese to withdraw faculties from someone. So for the members of your order, it's within your power as provincial to require them, say, to participate in a certain number of hours of yes. professional development yes. per year? Yes. Um, Dr Whelan, uh, can I turn to you, please? Um, I want to ask you about your own views on whether that there ought to be mandatory requirements of that kind. But just before the, I get to that, can you perhaps describe, please, the program you've de been developing in Parramatta? Yes, it's a program for clergy, not just for Parramatta. And the people organising it, apart from myself, is Sister Mari Biddle, who works with me at the Aquinas Academy, and Dr Gerard Webster, whom I believe is known to the Commission, had 30 years of experience in the area of therapy, particularly with sexual abuse. Uh, we took about a year to get a focus on what we were actually wanting to do, and uh, we came up with the idea, the, the title of professional enhancement. We want it to be a positive thing, something that promotes well-being, so that uh, clerics feel good about themselves and about their ministry, and the belief that people who are sad about getting out of bed in the morning to minister people aren't good ministers. It's not a question of... Um, Forcing happiness is a question of discovering something. Our focus will be relationships, and that's easier said than done, but the primary relationship is with oneself. What's going on inside a person becomes what's going on outside a person. Relationships that are realistic, honest, and life-giving do tend to beget um, a, a growth in well-being and an ability to connect with people in a way that is uh, life-giving too. Um, Self-awareness is going to be a, a crucial part of it. And uh, our, our method is going to be in, involve group discussions. We will watch movies together. Um, there will be input uh, on structures, ways of thinking, ways of processes of uh, dealing with what's going on with a person. We will look, for example, to the work of Eugene Gendelman and focusing as a way of listening. And uh, with a view to developing, uh, this is a bit of a pilot program, with a view to developing something that's translatable to other dioceses and other groups. And who, 
who will be attending, firstly, the pilot program? There are seven priests who have committed themselves to do it, and it'll take four weeks in the month of March, this coming March. Uh, there are people who've volunteered for the program? They've volunteered for the program. Has there been any discussion of whether the program is the kind of thing that would be appropriate to become mandatory? No. I'd resist that, quite frankly, Mr Free, because on the one hand, I think it should be some kind of supervision, some kind of appraisal should be mandatory. This kind of program, not necessarily. Um, can I ask the other panel members on this question? We'll, we'll talk specifically about supervision in a few moments and different types of supervision, focusing on what is often thought of as professional development. Um, can I ask the other panel members whether they have a view about whether there should be mandatory participation in professional development for priests and religious? Um, sister? Uh, yes, I do. Because every other profession is involved with people um, do have to have professional development and actually show that to their registering board. Uh, every year, how much supervision and how much develop, uh, professional development in the area that you're working uh, that you do, otherwise you don't, you get deregistered. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely important that we keep up to date with modern trends and what's actually happening. I, I have a little, diffi little difficulty with um, with the old age um, claim um, that people may be too tired. I understand that they would be tired. My doctor's 75, and I hope he's been doing some work um, before I get to see him, and he's still going. I, I don't buy it. I can't buy that. Do you have a view, Dr Mulvihill, on the whether it should be mandated? Well, on some very significant areas, it has to be. Um, around boundaries, given the number of boundary violations that continue to happen, as we heard from Geraldine um, Robertson the other day, there has to be more and more education about what is on and what is not, what is appropriate and what's not. Um, I also have a little difficulty with silos. I'm, I'm sorry, um, Father Whelan, but seven men um, who are priests, you know, together being mandated or, or maybe volunteering, it sounds like a great program how are we going to bust out of the silos so that people can grow in human development together, men and women, lay people, people who are in and out and so on. And I'm sure you've thought about all those things. Um, Is that an issue you would address by um, changing the, the participants in the program or the instructors? How would you address that concern? Well, I'm, I'm sure um, Father Whelan's gone through this with his team very finely and very well and they've had to make a decision. But for me, it's time to move past the silos. People need to be together. They need to be in groups talking and learning from each other, priests and religious and lay people and everybody else and perhaps into faith so that um, people start to loosen up a bit now. Um, it's time to get out of the silos. They don't work. Look what's happened. I, I, uh, I agree with what Dr Malva Hill is saying. One of the issues we did come up with, and we wrestled with this for over a year, we had to start somewhere, uh, prize the door open, as it were. I think we're dealing with a very, very elusive thing, and it's called culture. And if we don't do some serious uh, thinking about the culture that we're dealing with, we're not going to get anywhere. So... Uh, I would like to think that in time, and we actually did talk about having other people involved, um, if we can get it to work with one group, chances are we can get it to work with another group and different kinds of groups. So this is that experimentum. We've got to start somewhere. Could I just explore one thing, but it, it probably perplexes everybody in church, but surely those outside. Um, a comment that was made earlier, and it related to that, is the different approaches by women religious male religious and priests to formation, professional development, supervision. Can anyone under, give us a very simple understanding as why we see this pattern over and over again, that the women religious are very active in many areas, not only those areas, but social justice and others, the religious brothers to a lesser degree, and the clergy to a much, much, much lesser degree. Now, it's not just about gender. There's something else occurring. So just very shortly, so that underpins this conversation, what is it in the very structure and systemic nature of church and the formation of 
uh, religious and clergy that has led to a very long-standing um, approach, the, the one that I've indicated. My response to that is to recall some of the material I mentioned before, Constantinianism. I think it goes back to the 4th and 5th century, actually, its roots. Um, it's a bit simplistic, but I think clericalism is a major factor in it. It's, it's a, a system dominated by male clerics, and there's a lot of clericalism in that. Um, it was, I think, uh, part of the cultural mindset that having spent eight years in the seminary, you did not need any more training. You had it all. So that has, that's deeply embedded in Roman Catholic clergy, I think, and needs to be broken. So one, it's one factor, but I think it is a major one. Perhaps another factor might be, um, if it is, as we heard yesterday, some people, um, many, many people, believe they have been ontologically changed, then why would you need to do anything? Could I say, I think one of the differences is that, um, just firstly, just to say that clericalism and in, in a sense of entitlement is a common challenge for religious men and women too. It's not just for diocesan clergy, it's a challenge we face too. But I think especially, practically speaking, that from um, the 1970s onwards, uh, Catholic, um, the um, male men religious have been educated in a combined theological setting that was open to women and lay people and we had an education that was different and we influenced and, um, and assisted each other, that there was a, a much a much broader mixed education into which very early on um, in the, the late 70s, I think it would have been in our own consortium, um, <clears throat> uh, lay people also became part of the mix. And right through that period, we, we have worked as religious men and women and lay people more closely together. I think another factor is that uh, one of the differences between a diocesan structure and a religious order or institute structure is that the religious institute structure is more democratically based. Mm -hmm. So a provincial will be elected for a period of three or six years and then they, from being a rooster, they go back to being a feather duster. Uh, and um, that's, that's a pretty humbling experience uh, but the, our triennial uh, chapter process means that people are sitting around trying to organise things on a three-year cycle, and that's an important aspect. So the nature of the beast is quite different. We're smaller, uh, and I, I think we're more a little bit more agile, and I, I think some of the women religious institutes are way more agile than a lot of the male institutes. But it's that democratic, which ties into what Michael was saying earlier, it's the democratic nature of it that makes a, a very significant difference. Uh, if we decide, as we've had a change of administration in the last three months, I've been appointed the, um, the secretary of the province and I've been given a mandate to institute a whole stack of reviews, one of which will be formation and ongoing uh, professional development. Uh, if I had to do that in a diocesan structure, it might be like the document that took 15 years to develop. The urgent one. Yeah, the urgent one. Also looking at the, so the daily routine of a typical diocesan priest, it's very activity-based and... Um, People who are exhausted, priests who get exhausted or burn out, they would say, I feel like a sacramental machine, that I just do all these things. Whereas I think um, the women are freer to be on the edges of the mission, as you say, or like with refugees or with people who are suffering. So that requires more of a person to give oneself in ministry. So it's more formative in that way. That's sort of caricature, but that's one aspect I see. Um, can I just comment and go back to where you were a few minutes ago before yes. the Commissioner's intervention and that is around the mandating and the... Uh, I think there's a middle ground uh, between 
uh, Father Whelan's and Dr Mulverhill's position, and that is that I, I think you can have both. I think you can have sessions that are quite specific for particular groups of people, as psychologists or social workers do. Uh, but I think uh, Dr Mulverhill's point about being able to break out of a silo mentality is equally important, and I think there's a middle ground there. I agree with uh, Father Whelan that some courses should not be on the list of mandatory. They should, because they, you cut the legs out from underneath the program if they are mandatory. If you say you've all got to participate in this, some people are going to say, well, I'll turn up, but I'm not going to participate really. Uh, but again, the combination of a series of inputs uh, that are both, some of which are mandatory and some of which are voluntary will satisfy uh, elements of good professional development. Finally, I would say that while I agree with Dr Melvy Hill that there's a whole lot of input that needs to be around professional development issues, boundaries, understanding of child sexual abuse, etc., etc. Um, there are other things. Uh, one has to be to take a position that protects from uh, bad behaviour, but one has to prevent the bad behaviour in the first instance, and I think Father Wheeler's course is trying to do that preemptive strike, uh, as I, I, I would suggest that what we were talking about yesterday is equally trying to do that, that you do this positive stuff and this stuff that talks about restrictions. It can't be one or either. It has to be a combination of all of those elements, mandatory, uh, voluntary, uh, positive, restrictive. All of these things are required. It has to be with lay people and it has to be sometimes with particular groups. Um, Father, Mr Fred, yes. I think I read in this transcript the other day, uh, is it Dr Geraghty? Yes, uh, Dr Geraghty. Encouraged the Commission to look at the uh, documents on formation. Um, the Director of Ministry of Life and Priests says, ongoing formation is a right duty of the priest, and imparting it is a right duty of the Church. This is established in universal law, and the canon is 279. The latest document from um, Rome on Formation that just came out a few months ago talks about is the right on the, on the part of the faithful or the people who positively feel the effects of the good formation and holiness of their priests. And um, that's repeated um, also um, in Pastoris de Bonobus, that ongoing formation is necessary to ensure that the priest can properly respond to this right of the people of God. And further, um, um, Pastor Westabovo says, priests are not there to serve themselves but the people of God. So I think in the church's own documents, there's a, there's a voice there for the urgency. Thank you. And I think a right duty is a good combination of how to understand the dual yeah. sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Father, one of the other things that Dr Gerrity talked about in some of the written material that he's provided to the Commission and reflecting on his own experience as a uh, seminarian and as a priest um, was a different aspect of clericalism to the one we've been talking about. And, and this was the priest's perception of himself and of the inflated sense of uh, power that one was taught in the seminary, the feeling that one was superhuman uh, and fully ready to take on parish life. And what he describes as the reality of parish life was feelings of um, isolation and challenge, and it's something the Commission's heard in, from a number of witnesses that the reality of parish life for many priests was very confronting and lonely and isolating, and that those have also been identified as risk factors in terms of abuse and acting out. Um, uh, firstly, would, would you agree with that as a as a, a partial explanation of, of why there might have been problems with both abuse occurring in the past and an inadequate response to it? Yes. Yes, I would agree with that, Mr Free. Um, I think the research shows it's when, within the first five years of ordination that um, disorder happens. Yes. 
Um, another aspect of that which has come out of many accounts, Father, is uh, the feeling that one was alone in priestly life and lacking supervision and support. Would you agree with that as a significant structural issue? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, is, it, is it still a significant structural flaw, do you think, a lack of support? Uh, not, not to the same degree. Um, I know from my experience in the Archdiocese of Melbourne, they have a program for the first 10 years. So they would call uh, two conferences a year for, um, for the priest ordained up until their 10th year. And um, also um, they have developed a, not uniform, but a mentor system uh, for people with, with difficulties. Um, and the, the latest document too that came out, I think December just last year from Rome, the gift of the priestly vocation, talks about stages and ages of, um, of formation post-ordination. And so they identify the first years as critical, the middle years and the later years. So there's a beginning of an awareness, and, but again, it's far from perfect. Um, can you just give us a little more detail, Father, and focusing first on the Archdiocese of Melbourne? What are the supervision arrangements that apply to priests in the Archdiocese? The supervision... What are the supervision arrangements? Arrangements, yes. What's on offer is the, the Ministry of the Priest, which is the office, um, offers supervision groups for, for priests to join, so that um, people come and they um, pay the person professionally who's uh, an accredited supervisor to have supervision groups uh, throughout the year. The uptake of that would be perhaps three groups of uh, five or six out of a cohort of 200 and So that's entirely voluntary? That's voluntary. And um, but continuing on too from those days of the Vince DeWye program and uh, there's other um, support groups uh, that are evident and they do engage in... Um, I was connected with one um, when I was an assembly staff, as an example. Um, a number of priests were ordained and they were moving to rural diocese, wanted, they were scared about the future. So they wanted to form something for at least one or two years, those first years. So they employed a supervisor and they drew up a program where they um, met on a Monday night and then they had the next day with um, critical incident then an open group time, uh, Eucharist and prayer, and um, even one worked his way out of the priesthood uh, and was supported and discerned with the group's help. Um, and they were quite outstanding pastors today. So there's an, exa an example of um, what can happen and does happen, but again, that would represent about 15% of the priest ordained since the year 2000. That group that you're describing there, that was just self-motivated, was it? That was self-motivated, but we constructed a process, and it's been going for 15 years. Thank you. You also referred a couple of minutes ago to a mentoring system for people with difficulties. Can you just explain how people come to be within that kind of mentoring system? OK, so um, it might be uh, a pastor that's having difficulty with... Um, um, being a pastor, that um, he's, um, he doesn't realise how he's coming across as perhaps authoritarian, um, not open, not walking with his people. Um, so there's unhappiness. And um, so as a way of addressing some of those uh, issues, there'll be <coughs> reference to a psychologist and then also that he would um, be twinned with a... Very past an uh, older um, priest who would meet with him regularly and workshop issues through with him about his difficulties. Thank you. Um, Father Burke, you've also been involved in developing a, a, a self appraisal system, is that right? That's, yes, it was developed uh, not by me but by a committee of people in '97 by the Australian Catholic Bishops Commission, and what I did was um, revise it and update it. And, Enlarge, um, offer a, a process B. So that's something that's been developed at the national level? That was, that's correct, yes. Is that 
Is that then available to all um, priests across the country, or is, does it depend on whether the individual diocese have taken that up? Well, it's available through, you know, my role or office, sorry, the uh, National Clergy uh, Law the Ministry Directory. And um, through that network of the state conferences and the um, annual national conferences, we have presented the <coughs> appraisal to the directors to take back to their diocese. Um, the explanation is available on the website. In my electronic newsletter, I talk about it, that it's available. So um, a number of priests have done it throughout Australia over the last 20 years. And um, I know the, like, uh, the psychologist who works with the clergy in um, Brisbane has a copy of it and has, um, uh, I think, workshops with, um, with the clergy up there. Um, in Melbourne, in my time, as the last five years, I was um, clergy life and ministry in Melbourne, and uh, about 20 uh, parish priests did the appraisal. Um, it was on their initiative. Can you just summarise, please, for the commissioners what's involved in the process? Uh, yes, sure. Um, well, first of all, um, what happens is that um, at the moment it's the priest who <coughs> initiates, he, he wants to do it. So um, what happens is that um, we um, agree on a supervisor and also a facilitator, sort of a secretarial work. And um, the priest then um, um, is asked to nominate up to about 12 people um, that he has things to do with in his ministry. He's coached not to have his friends or the people that like him, but people from different aspects. So perhaps somebody on the fringe of the parish who may not belong to the parish, at the school, uh, in the office, uh, in, in, um, working with youth or the different groups. And um, so a number of them, not all of them, then are contacted by the facilitator and invited to participate in an appraisal process. And uh, if they agree, they um, answer questions on seven levels. And, um, and then meanwhile, the priest then does his own appraisal, um, answering the same topics but with different questions. And... Uh, what I developed was, um, it was that um, people would score uh, the priest one to seven. And what I found was that when the priest came to see a graph, everybody wanted to know whether it was above the line or under the line, 50%. And that was the thing. What was important was the concrete examples that the people could give in the observation encounter of um, what they were talking about. And so um, the facilitator then puts the priest's appraisal <laughs> what the people say together and synthesises um, the important issues and elements. Then there is a version where then, um, those people can come to an open meeting with the priest and facilitator to workshop um, what they responded to. In one case, uh, the parish priest invited the whole parish uh, to, to be free to participate, to take a questionnaire at home. And we had a you know, parish hall full of people working it through. But what happens then is that um, the issues become clear and then we get down to um, what are we going to do about it. So we make, um, identify them, uh, the issues, and then make short-term goals, long-term goals, uh, how are we going to recognise that it's been achieved and what's the timeline. So, I mean, I can give you an example. Yes, please, if you'd like. Um, so I think we've got to intend to bundle the, um, the appraisal itself. Yes. Uh, are you talking about the longer... The, the form, longer one, and I'd just that's like to focus on page 24. Yes, so it's tab 36 of the tender bundle. Personal and professional ministry. Yeah, correct. Thank you. 
So there's an, um, uh, a number of statements, and so the people um, read through that and um, they respond to what they wish with a written comment about um, how the priest is related to them or comes across to them according to those issues. For example, the number two is relating well with people and listening to their advice. Three, having a sense of responsibility to the parish. Six, seeking broad input before making decisions. Nine, maintains his physical fitness and personal appearance. Ten, taking time out for himself to relax and pursue other interests and hobbies. And twelve, developing a supporting network for his ministry. <coughs> so there was a case, you see, where a priest, um, he, didn't, he did everything himself. He didn't involve his people in um, helping in ministry because he loved his people so much. He had this idea that he had to serve, he had to do it, he had to serve those people. So the, but the response was that um, he doesn't let us do anything. He doesn't enable us to, to grow in our ministry. Um, he doesn't consult us. Um, we, don't, we feel we don't have. So bringing that awareness to the priest, um, it's uh, asking to see that. And um, so the case was really that um, he was afraid to let go of control. So we would ask three things that you would do. Or ask, in the short term, to ask three people to do something for you, which would be a new behaviour for him. And you and it would probably bring up anxieties for him. That the job, the job wouldn't be done properly, you know, it'd be my fault and those type of ideas. Then a longer term goal would be to read um, books and articles on what is ministry today, what is the strategy of being a pastor, what is you know, the call of Philippi to lay people. Another one might be go away and take a holiday because the people say you don't have a holiday. You're looking overweight. You're always tired. You're falling asleep during meetings. And then to introduce him to what supervision is to explain how it works and the goodness of it and how it can help you to change and to grow. And um, then the longer term goal, we might come back in one year and look at the profile of the parish, see if there's new groups, new signs of life in the parish because the leadership has changed its behaviour. That's sort of an example of how the, uh, the appraisal would work in effect. Um. You've given some reference to um, instances where people have used this self-appraisal system. What's the overall sense of how much it is being taken up by priests? Oh, yes. Well, um, from my experience in Melbourne, I think in the five years, uh, there was about 20 did it, and that would be out of a possibility of about 200, so it's about 10 percent. Do you have any idea outside of Melbourne, of whether that's replicated, that kind of proportion is replicated elsewhere? Um, yes, well, I'll take my mind just give a feeling. Um, it would be about the same, if, if less. Thank you. Um, do you have a view, Father Burke, on whether a system of mandatory supervision is required rather than voluntary supervision of this, or voluntary self-appraisal? Um, well, an example is really like the MSC or the Missionaries of the Sacred Heart. <coughs> they, are, they took up this appraisal in the year 2000, and now today they have their standard practice in their order for all their parish priests. And I believe, it's without question, it's just the way we do things. So it's taken probably 10 years to engage in that. But once people engage in the process... Of course they're anxious at the beginning, but they are pleased they've done it, they see the difference. And uh, so that's an example that mandatory, with education and timeline, you can change, you can turn the boat around, but it takes time, it takes education, but it takes a will. And then referring to the church's own documents, Pastoris de Bovobus, there's a right duty, there's a, there's, a, there's a must really in the documents. Do you, would you then favour extending that kind of approach of the missionaries more broadly to make it a requirement to participate? 
Look, it's got drawbacks, but I would put my hand up in favour of going forward to make it mandatory. Thank you. Um, Before you move on, um, Father, do you think this uh, self-appraisal uh, will highlight or identify warning signs? Uh, Dr Gardner, in her uh, evidence to us yesterday, um, said that there are signs of um, conflict in a person which exhibit themselves in, for instance, irritation or anger. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, we know ourselves that um, um, signs of excessive interest in children mm -hmm. uh, are, a, are, are a warning sign. Mm -hmm. This process of self-appraisal does it serve that purpose of identifying or warning that risk and uh, um, uh, and the justifiable concern yes. um, should be identified? It could well flag, you know, anger, alcoholism, other behaviours that we would recognise as red flags. But I think that's a really good suggestion. I mean, this is not the end product. I think it should be revised and enlarged. It also puts the responsibility and the need to have a professionally trained facilitator who can easily read those red flags and respond. I think there's a, there's a right duty to have the best people that we can have to facilitate these um, appraisals. You see, if you look at item one, uh, somebody, whether religious or not, who exhibits joy and peace in their life is likely to be a person Mm. you can trust and who's uh, content and, mm. and uh, going about their life as, as you would hope they could. Mm. Uh, a priest who doesn't exhibit joy and peace mm. in his chosen life uh, and irrita uh, indicates anger and irritation and That's alcohol abuse, excessive interest in children, mm. um, boundary violations. Um, this process needs to pick up both the pluses and the minuses, doesn't it? It does. Mm -hmm. And do you think it does at present? Um, I don't think it's good enough in that area. I think it can be improved. I think it would pick up some of those behaviours, <coughs> but there's... N it should... Maybe our colleagues could comment, but it, it could have an inbuilt um, development if these... If this is a pattern of behaviour, you know, go to the page of um, disordered behaviour. Are there deep underlying issues? Should we consult with somebody about how this reads? Um, you see, professional development in any professional sense seeks to bolster strengths mm -hmm. and address weaknesses. That's a basic managerial function. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this, as I read it, present, is um, a little directed towards um, strengths and not recognising that it's in fact not the strengths you need to worry about, it's the weaknesses you need to worry about. Um, would you agree? Yes, when I think about it, I think it's more optimistic in this presentation. So can I just follow on from that and perhaps uh, asking uh, Father McDonough and uh, Sister, um, would such a tool or way have made an impact in relation to abuse within religious orders? One of the things that uh, I think has surprised everybody is that in religious orders where the numbers are quite large, particularly in the male orders, um, most people would say they didn't know. Um, it's very hard for people to look and say, how can you live so closely with men who have been abusing? But that's not the question. The question is whether this sort of instrument, this sort of approach, um, is one that would have application within the religious orders to do what uh, Commissioner Murray is doing, is to obviously be a positive thing in terms of helping people uh, in their personal wellbeing and their ministry, but very importantly, start to pick up signs of distress or distorted thinking behaviours 
would that have made a difference or would it make a difference today? I would say, of course, it would make a difference. And um, as it gets developed and deepened, you know, uh, from the points you were making, Commissioner, um, yes, it, it would have made a difference and it will make a difference. I think with um, religious orders, many of the things that have already been mentioned, supervision, spiritual direction, opportunities, um, they've all been there. Um, I think one of the things as religious have learned more about the issues of child abuse and uh, their causes um, and learned to be more attentive to behaviours in particular. Um, the fact that, speaking from my congregation and from my job as a provincial, for example, um, we see a lot of these warning signs much more now, much more obviously, um, and need and recognise our need to take action over them um, much more swiftly than we would have in the past. Um, you see the irritation, you see the anger, you see the drinking too much, you see the too tiredness, um, <clears throat> you see the isolation, um, you see the lack of friendships, the lack of other interests, you see those warning signs now. And whereas in the past we would have said, oh, well, that's father so-and-so, that's brother so-and-so, now we don't... as frequently do that. So we see those behaviours um, and act on them. And also from the point of view of supervision, apart from the professional supervision that they might go to, which might come back to someone like me or, or normally would not. Um, but the, both myself in my, my supervisory role, um, the local community leader in which a religious is living, a man or a woman, um, and that doesn't just mean living necessarily in the same house for some religious women, but the, the person who helps coordinate them. Um, but their, their community leader, um, myself as a provincial or their, their provincial, and also um, for clerical religious in particular, especially for the, some of the younger ones, um, their parish priest with whom they're working give feedback um, to us and then allow us to to take action. One of the challenges at the moment is that there are a number of newer orders that have come to Australia who don't have those things in place or those awarenesses. And also another level of um, supervision is with orders like my own or the Franciscans or the Redemptorists who are now bringing overseas candidates in to um, that's another level of supervision and awareness that needs to be taken. I'm going to just uh, raise one or two issues from that. Um, one is that in Father Burke's uh, evidence, he's indicated that part of the proposal was the appointment of an external facilitator, I think you indicated. It's not one of the problems within the religious orders because of uh, the familial nature of those, the closeness of the confreres and sisters, and your own indication that most people are not confrontational, um, a common aspect. Is it not the case that the missing link is two things? One is the actual having formal processes of evaluation and assessment, which takes away the personal reflections. That is, he's acting a bit weird, rather actually saying there's a formal process that picks it up. And the second is that it's facilitated by an external person to the order that doesn't have the emotional attachment to the very people that are being assessed, which surely in some way must distort all the yes. assessments and supervisions yes. uh, when you're so closely associated with Two someone. things I'd say to that. One is that um, where we do recognise a behaviour, we do realise now that we're not the ones who can address it and we need someone to come from outside, inside, to to do that for us or send our person out to you just to need them. to move to the microphone. Sorry. Yes, we realise that um, when we do see that behaviour, <clears throat> now we realise that we can't address it ourselves because we're compromised and we do need to bring people in. I think that would be the case with most many religious orders. Also, um, now, um, most religious orders, again, have a formation commission made up not just of the religious but of people quite independent of the order, um, lay people, men and women, from professional backgrounds of, um, in psychology, management, whatever. Um, who are monitoring what's happening to the behaviours of religious and telling us this needs to be acted on or that needs to be acted on. 
and giving us advice of the best way to do it. Just my final question to that, and Sister Crotty might want to comment. Would you believe that the new orders that are coming into Australia, um, those that are both having um, ordained uh, and uh, vowed uh, religious from overseas, do you think it should be a requirement of the Catholic Church that they do, in fact, have processes that you've just identified as part of their right to practice within Australia? Yes. And that's within the rights of the bishops to do so? Yes, I think it is. And it will be within the rights of the Catholic Professional Standards Limited when it is um, fully operational. And would it be the case that at the moment there is some vulnerability within the Catholic Church because those sort of processes are not mandated nor in fact practised as yes. good practice? Yes. Is that so? Yes, of course. Yes. And Sister Crotty, do you have any comments on those matters? Yes, I would agree with everything that Father McDonough just said with, with regard to that. I think that definitely the, uh, there's an ins this instrument here, which is good on face value, I think needs to be depth and needs to be a lot more specific in, in the way that people are appraised um, uh, to really give people a better understanding of who they are and what they're doing and that's a develop, developmental um, in what they're doing. Have the female religious orders, to your knowledge, Sister Crotty, been... Um, more willing or able or have ventured down this path or are they still uh, reluctant to use external methods of either self-appraisal or appraisal more generally? I, I think the religious orders, are so, I can only speak of my own uh, order and um, I work within, we have uh, Macaulay Ministries it's called or the unincorporated ministries come under that and we are answerable to them. Um, and we will be appraised, I am sure. It's only a new organisation that's been formed. But we have to show them our professional development and our supervision on a 12-monthly basis. So I think it's coming in very much more religious, or, uh, religious orders of women if are really picking up these issues. If I could just add to what Sister says, um, in my asking other religious congregations about this matter as prior to coming here, um, the sisters' orders that I, I spoke to, they're responsible people. Any of them, nearly all of them, all of their sisters or most of their sisters who are in responsible positions are receiving group supervision and personal supervision at the same time. Um, they're receiving, receiving both. Thank you. Dr Mulvihill, uh, sorry. I'm just interested um, not to label this, but this is about the personal and the professional and they're mixed. And I, I'd hope you think about that. I think they're two entirely different aspects. Yeah, Let's not get them mixed up, because that's what's happened in the first place. The, the, the two have been mixed and taken personally, and then boundary violations happen. Father Whelan, I think you... Yeah, I think there's a, another issue here that is more informal and more elusive. In more than 50 years as a religious, if I was to name one thing that has been problematic for community life, it's the breakdown of communication or the inability, as the letter to the Ephesians says, to speak the truth in love. Um, it's almost taken as an invasion of privacy or a conflictual sort of a thing to move in that direction of speaking openly and lovingly and caringly about a person's faults that are manifesting themselves. I think the culture and religious life, and I don't think my own religious congregation is alone in this, is don't say anything. Or you get a triangulated conversation about it. So instead of my telling person A that, you know, or asking person A, you know, what's going on with you, I go to person B and C and D and talk about person A. And it might get back to person A sometime, but it might not too. It's not a, a culture of healthy communication in some. Father Whelan, there's something that arises from that uh, in my mind. Um, I would accept uh, as a basic right that the personal and the private is no one's business Correct. but their own. But if you make a public vow or promise, for instance, of celibacy and chastity, yes. by that very publicising of a commitment, it entitles those, in my view, who 
who manage you to ask about those matters. Now, you may know that the other day, um, uh, one of our witnesses, um, uh, the Archbishop from Brisbane, said he had no right, he felt he had no right, to question such matters. And yet we have heard, for instance, from Dr. Robinson, that breaking, or sorry, that the matter of celibacy is not a causal factor, but a contributing factor mm -hmm. in the violation of children. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you think uh, that having made a public promise, a known public commitment to vows or promises of celibacy and chastity, that in fact it is open for those supervising or managing to ask such questions in that private sphere? I think it's incumbent upon them to do that, really. We owe it to the people that we serve. Um, another factor that I think that it's at play here, and I had a document in what I submitted earlier about the discouragement of friendship, which I think didn't allow the kind of trust to build which would be the basis on which you would go to someone and say, look, I'm concerned about your behaviour, whatever. Now, invasion of privacy of one, is one thing. Um, calling someone to order appropriately in terms of their public behaviour, which you quite rightly point to, is quite a different matter. Could I ask uh, whether any member of the panel disagrees with Father Whelan's response? I, I don't disagree with uh, the basic... Uh, direction. What, what I would say, I listened to Archbishop Col Coleridge's response, and what I would say in respect of that is, uh, organisationally, it's probably not appropriate for the Archbishop to get into a situation of asking that question. But he can delegate that responsibility to somebody who should be asking that question. In other words, um, he doesn't have to take on every single responsibility, but he has to make sure that it is taken up. And I think it is a correct procedure to be able to, as you stated, um, you make public vows, you're held to account. Um, and I think that's a, a more than reasonable thing. When I joined the Franciscans, I was somewhat surprised at the poor level of training around good communication. I, I think... Religious life, um, as I've observed it and experienced it over the years, is rife with very poor communication skills. And that's why I was saying earlier, I agree with Dr Mulverhill that you need training around boundary setting, but you also need the stuff that allows functioning relationships to actually function better than what they do. And that's... The dysfunction there is causal and a whole lot of negative things occurring and that needs to be treated way back at the beginning. So, uh, and, and I sense it takes on an organisational aspect then when it comes to the responses of institutions to the victims of sexual abuse because this is the way they get related to, in, not in a relational way, in a non-relational way. Yeah, that might be a convenient moment. We'll take the morning adjournment.